Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church today. Good to see you. Come in, find yourselves a spot. There's plenty of spots. Um, I'm going to get started. We're going to start our time together uh, in prayer. Father, thank you that we can be together as your people today. Uh, I pray that you'd encourage us as uh, we hear your word read, as we talk about it and think about it for ourselves. We pray that we'd be encouraged as uh, we're together. We can show love and care and concern uh, for each other. Uh, we ask that you would clear our hearts and minds and prepare us uh, to, to hear from you and to meet uh, with you this morning. Uh, we pray for those who aren't, can't be with us today for various reasons, for sickness, uh, for all kinds of reasons, and, and we ask for healing uh, for them. Uh, we thank you that we can meet together in person for those who can meet with us online as well. Um, and we just commit our morning to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, great to see you this morning. Uh, we're going to start our morning, as we often do, in song. So let me encourage you to warm up your voices and to stand up as we sing together. Let's stand and sing. Sing together. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before foundations you predestined to adopt me as your own you have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost but Jesus your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone but nothing I did could ever atone but Jesus you paid my debt by your blood I have redemption and salvation day from the night, Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own, head full of rocks and heart made of stone, but Spirit, you moved in me. And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone. And called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by and grace alone I will save my sin by grace and grace alone I will reach the end by grace and grace alone 
Let me welcome you again. Uh, for those that came in, let's singing. Great to have you with us. My name is Murray. I'm the pastor here uh, at St. Hilda's. It's great to be with you um, this morning. And we've already sung some pretty 
big truth, has made some pretty big claims about who we are and our life and where our wealth is and our hope is, uh, how much we hold on to our own stuff, how much we see Jesus as King. And we'll be thinking about these things more as we continue through, um, through Matthew, through the stories that Jesus is telling, particularly as he looks towards the end. We're getting pretty close to the cross in the story. There's a few weeks to go, the story slows down, but we're getting quite close to that point uh, in the story that Matthew tells of Jesus. And we see what that means for us as Jesus tells these stories. We're going to, to uh, continue together, we're going to pray, we're going to pray some words that Jesus taught his disciples uh, to pray. So would you join me as we, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, which I believe will be on the screen. Let's pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. There's a fair bit going on for us as a church. The, the big thing coming up for us um, may not be that exciting to many, but it's our AGM, which is happening uh, next Sunday at 3 p.m., AGM's annual general meeting. And it doesn't look like you've got the forms as you came in, which is good, because I might read it during my sermon. But Emma's going to hold up for you, a, a, at the back, a, a copy of our annual report. And in that report is a report from myself, also from our wardens and our treasurer. Um, and yes, it's kind of a business report, but there's still lots of encouraging things in there. So I encourage you uh, to grab one of those on your way out and prayerfully read it through this coming week. And don't doubt any questions you might have um, that you would like me to talk about or someone to talk about or for the parish council to think about in the coming uh, next season. There's also uh, there separately um, is a sheet of kind of some financial uh, figures you may not be into that, you may want to take that, you might not want to, they're printed separately. That just shows our, um, our kind of financial books for last year, uh, as well as our budget for the year to come, uh, and just the general kind of financial uh, state and health of the church. So please, if you'd like to, have a look at that as well, and that's, you're happy like, to look at that and get some tricky questions for our treasurer, uh, he'll be there uh, next week as well, make a nice curly one, that would be good. Um, no, nah, but it's... it's Overall, it's really encouraging. I hope it really encourages you to read uh, those reports and see what we're up to and think about the year to come. So please, if you can, 3 p.m. Uh, next uh, Sunday. And as part of that, I need people to be nominated to be wardens, parish councillors, uh, and nominators. Nominators are the people that would choose a new senior minister if you need one. I hope you don't. Um, but those are all important roles. And I really love you guys to be doing those nominations today so I have them ready for next week. Uh, it would be excellent. Uh, so please do that. When you finish them, you can put them in the box at the back, um, at the Hilda's Hub area, or hand them directly to me. Um, that's fine. Uh, also coming up, uh, we've mentioned this a few times, we've got a basket weaving afternoon, afternoon, morning and afternoon, uh, coming up in a little while. I'm just going to ask Fee to kind of tell us why we should care about baskets and weaving and stuff. Um, thanks, Fee. Um, when we ran our first weaving little art escape created to create workshop last year, um, I mentioned to you the reason behind it, and so I just wanted to share that again. Um, we're a wonderful community here. Love coming and hanging out with you on Sunday. It's great. Um, but this is by ha running the. We, we've got quite a few artists in the in the congregation, and I'm hoping that we can develop this uh, ministry further beyond basket weaving, because there's so many more, ex well, basket weaving is great, but, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff out there that you can get involved in. Um, the reasoning behind running these workshops is so that we can be just part of our community. We can be inviting people into our community, we can be reaching out to our community by just running some things that are happening here at church, um, which is a very low stress kind of way for people just to come in, bring your friends, hang out together, 
do something fun. Sounds pretty good to me. So that's what's kind of behind this. So we just sort of pray that God will use those times that we share with our friends in church, out of church, strangers, people we don't know, who come to these courses um, and workshops um, to just build our relationships with each other and just to build our community. So that's, that's really the long and short of what's that. So anyway, it's on. So sign up. There's already about 12 people, I think, um, committed to coming, of which I think maybe three of us are from church. So invite your friends. Feel free to talk to me about it afterwards. Um, next term, I'm hoping, that we're going to be running a, um, a painting watercolour workshop. We'll see how that goes. Okay? And if you've got some things that you think you could contribute to um, creatively that other people might enjoy being a part of, then do come and chat with me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fee. Um, yeah, lots of artistic skill out there. Lovely to see what you can come up with over the next uh, little while. Um, oh, something else I was going to say. Yeah, we, uh, today, we, uh, as we look in the, in the Bible, we are seeing Jesus talk to us about how we uh, love and care for uh, those who are maybe the lowest and least in our community, those that um, uh, are maybe vulnerable and uh, um, weaker, or for whatever reason. We're gonna, I'll unpack that a little bit later. But it made me think, I'd love to just spend a moment, and is Kathy here somewhere? Yes, I kind of warned her but didn't prepare this. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about um, safe ministry in our church. I want to talk about it whilst the kids are in uh, as well. Uh, safe ministry as a kind of a, a broad concept is how we as a church care for um, children but also anyone who's a vulnerable uh, person uh, in, our, in our church because uh, we want this place to be a place that really cares for and loves uh, all kinds of people. We want it to be a safe place for anyone that comes to our church, a place where they feel um, comfortable for uh, and not threatened in any sense at all, uh, and that's part of, that's all our responsibility. I'm going to ask Kathy, you can use this, I'll hop across in a second, is um, what are some of the things we have in place already to help our community be a safe place for kids and vulnerable people? Uh, I don't think Belinda's here today, she's actually the one who um, oversees safe ministry, but um, the things we have in place, we've got um, anyone who is working with children in the church has to have a working with children check so that's an easy thing to get and then there's a safe ministry course that actually helps us think through how we can um, look after children and vulnerable people um, looking after ourselves just being very careful um, to always have uh, more than one leader with children to have the right ratio of people with children and to have the right people with children it's not everybody's cup of tea, but we just love to work with kids and youth, and so we want to do the best for them. Um, Safe Ministry is uh, about leadership, but it's, it's more than leadership as well. It's, um, we want to make sure we have a safe space, and so there's kind of our h &S, the things we have as part of that. Uh, and so um, and there's also about accessibility to all kinds of people as, as well. Uh, I've uh, started emailing the text of my sermon to people who find it easier to read, and that's something that, you know, you would like me to do, I can put on that list uh, if, if for whatever reason it's hard to kind of hear or follow along with, with me. We want to make it accessible and, and friendly and welcoming to, to everyone, um, wherever you're at. Um, you talked about safe ministry training, and we ha like it's a requirement for our kids' leaders and our youth leaders and for other positions why, why not, like, should other people do it too? What do you think about that, Cathy? Love the first question. <laughs> uh, absolutely. It's, it's not just for, ch uh, for people working with children, but vulnerable people as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things about safe ministry. It's not just relational, it's physical, as you said. So all the stuff we've done um, here to help people fit in the church with... Um, prams or walkers or whatever it is. So there's lots of things, even just uh, people welcoming on the door, just to be aware of how to care for people in a safe environment. So it really is um, a worthwhile thing for anyone to do. 
Um, great, excellent. Um, thanks, Kathy. I think that's all my questions for at the moment. Uh, I do want to say, uh, if anyone has any concern about anything, um, kids as well, I'm talking to you guys, if you have any concern about how uh, a leader or someone else is acting uh, towards you, if it makes you uncomfortable in any way, I uh, really want you to be able to tell someone uh, that you trust, be able to tell a parent, be able to tell um, Kathy or Marco is also our, one of our safe ministry uh, reps, or you can talk to me, someone you feel comfortable with. We don't want this to be a place where anyone feels scared or unsafe uh, for any reason, so please, please, please uh, feel free to talk to someone if anything happens that makes you feel uncomfortable or, or scared or worried. We want church to be a place that loves everyone and cares for everyone. Um, yeah, and if you have any concerns, please don't keep them quiet. Uh, please talk to me or an appropriate person, this is to anyone uh, as well. Uh, I think I made my point, I think. <laughs> but it's really important, and we, we just the damage that's been done in church communities when people uh, either intentionally or unintentionally have crossed boundaries that they shouldn't have. Uh, it's devastating, and we don't want that to happen in our community. Uh, I'm very serious about that. Well, uh, in a moment, the kids are going to go to the excellent program with the excellent safe ministry trained leaders. And, um, and as I do, they'll do that in a moment, I'll pray for them in just a moment. As I do that, you'll notice we're going to have a lot of room in the middle. If you feel like you're a long way away, you feel free to use the opportunity to come and, uh, come and find a, a seat a bit closer if that's what you'd like. Um, I don't bite and don't spit much, I don't think, um, as I speak. But uh, so they'll do that in just a moment. Uh, as we do, there's a fair bit of live music going on in the city at the moment. You may have noticed someone coming and having some big concerts in town. You may be excited about that. You might not care. Uh, but as the kids go out, perhaps you can talk to someone around you, say hi, and maybe share your favorite live music experience ever, apart from this morning, of course, um, your other favorite live music experience that you've, uh, that you've experienced. I'm going to pray for the kids. They're going to head out and have a chat just for a few moments as they uh, settle, uh, settle into their programs. I'll pray for the kids. Father, we know that um, all people are precious to you, and you tell us so clearly that, um, that you have a particular heart for the weak and the vulnerable, uh, for the, the young, uh, for those at all kinds of disadvantage um, or with less power. And I pray, Father, that our church will be a place uh, where everyone is safe and welcomed and loved appropriately, uh, we just really pray for the protection and well-being of our community, uh, for all people, particularly those who are vulnerable for whatever reason. And we just uh, commit um, our children to you and, and all of us to you, particularly this morning as the kids go to their programs. Uh, please be teaching them from your word. May they know you, that uh, the, the God who is love and who is safe uh, and who is perfect, and that have great comfort in, uh, in knowing you um, and learning more about you in this um, in this great community of friends and leaders. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, kids and youth, hop up, off you go. If you want to chat to someone around you, favourite live music experience. Uh, sometimes these questions have deep significance and relationship to the, to the sermon. Other times they don't. This is one of those times where it has nothing, no relation at all that I've thought of yet, at least. Um, has anyone want to share an experience, Judy? Right, so camp out at Wonderland, lots of Christian, Christian artists. I'm guessing White Stripes wasn't. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> so, I was like, I don't think it's a Christian. But uh, DC Talk, yeah, yeah, those guys at that area. Yeah, DC Talk, that was big when I was a younger person. That was great. Yeah, fun. A anyone else want to share? Yeah, great. Great. Blue Mountains Musical Festival a couple of years ago. Big crowd, all ages, lots of mud. Is that what you said? Yeah. But that makes it as well. The mud, mud, the mud's part of it. But uh, yeah, great. John.
Nora Jones, three-course meal, vineyard, five-star accommodation, free tickets. What, someone else won the competition and gave it to you. That is pretty good. I'm not sure I can, I can, I want to top that, or? Oh, yes, we're going to take her over here. Yes, Linda. Camping gear, yeah. Oh, fun. Launch something, yeah, yeah, yeah. James Morrison in the outback, everyone's in black tie, you guys are in your camping gear. Again, free tickets, I'm sensing a theme here. Free tickets are a winner. I once got free tickets and actually, to my, I have to confess, I was actually organising this whilst I was in a church service that I was part of. But someone else, that was free, and I was like, oh. Anyway, I went and saw Ben Folds, I think, at the Opera House. That was fun. All right. We could talk about this over morning tea. <laughs> As I said, there's no link to anything that I can think of yet. Um, is anyone going in to see Miss Swift? Is, no? No Taylor Swift? Fan? I mean, some people I know are going who aren't here right now, but, um, yeah. Exciting. All right. Well, uh, we're going to read God's Word. Um, Michelle is going to read for us, and I'll pray as she comes up. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that you speak to us uh, through it. We thank you that, um, yeah, for the gift of music and song, and thank you that we can enjoy it together uh, as we sing um, here. Uh, thank you for the, the beauty of it, and that we can enjoy it in other contexts as well. Uh, Father, I pray that you would speak to us uh, through your word today, that you'd encourage us, that you'd challenge us, and grow us more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to read from Matthew 25, if you want to find that or follow along uh, on the screen. Thanks. Sorry, my glasses just got foggy. <laughs> So today we're reading from Matthew chapter 25 and we're looking at verses 31 to 46. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did, you see, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, 
Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I wonder if uh, any of you are familiar with uh, the undercover boss genre of TV shows. Have you guys seen those? There's a picture on the screen to give you an idea. Um, I haven't seen too many of these myself, but, um, but, I, but I've, seen, I've seen enough to get the, get the concept. Uh, basically, the CEO or the boss of a company uh, will uh, dress up uh, as a regular employee, disguise themselves a bit, you know, a little extra facial hair or whatever it is in that, in that photo. Um, and they might turn up and pretend like it's their first day. It's their, 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 there is a new employee, they're training, and they can see what goes on at the company kind of at, a, at, at the level of the workers. And it's great, you know, they can see, you know, the struggles and the joys of their employees uh, firsthand. They can see what it's, like, what it's really like to work for their company. They'll see some great things, they'll, they'll hear some great stories. But sometimes also they'll see some things that aren't so good, won't they? They'll see some poor behavior. They'll see people who disregard the company rules and policies. They'll might hear things about themselves that aren't very uh, um, nice. They might find a, a culture where new employees aren't treated well, where they're not welcomed, but they're made fun of or marginalized. And this, the boss might experience some of this behavior themselves. You know, encouragement to shoplift or whatever it is, or cheat on their timesheet or whatever it might be. There might be all kinds of things that they see at this level. And you can well imagine that, um, it, you know, it doesn't go well for the, for the staff and the managers who are found to be uh, mistreating uh, their, their colleagues or their other people in their care. And if I remember correctly, the shows kind of end in like a judgment day, don't they? Um, the boss is revealed for who they are, really, and the, the key employees in the story are brought before uh, them one by one. And some are recognized for the exemplary work, you've done really well, they might get promoted, um, some are given gifts, you know, I know you've got an issue with at home and here's a million dollars to sort out your life or whatever it is. But, but there's also those that are found to be abusing their position and that's a little more awkward, isn't it? Um, firstly, that they're mortified at treating their boss in that way. Never would have done it if they'd known who that was. And there's consequences, right? Maybe retraining or, or maybe even losing their jobs or whatever it might be. How, how they treat their boss when they're weak and lowly directly impacts how they're judged when he's revealed or she's revealed in all their power and their glory. Um, you might have seen these kind of shows, you might not have seen these shows, the, this kind of genre of people um, appearing uh, weak and unimportant, is all kinds of, there's all kinds of scenarios where this happens in, in you know, stories where the princess swaps with the, the regular person or the YouTube video where the pro basketballer dresses up as an old dude and then teaches the young guys a lesson or whatever it is. Uh, there's often these opportunities where uh, these, these times when we see um, someone mistreated because they were um, they didn't know who they they didn't they weren't recognised for who they really were, and there's sometimes consequences for that. It's all a bit of fun, but I wonder if, if you have a situation yourself where um, where you treated someone or spoke to someone in a particular way, and uh, it came back to bite you because you didn't know who they were. You know the person that you. You cut off in traffic or bled your horn at, ends up driving into the employee car park with you and it turns out that they're your boss or something. I don't know. This might happen to you in some, in some sense. You treated someone in a way that you wouldn't have if you knew who they really were. And today, Jesus tells a story, and it's a bit of a cosmic version of Undercover Boss, I reckon. And it's a story where, someone, where, where the people's response to the weak and powerless it makes a real difference when they stand before the powerful one, before the king. And, and it goes so far in this story, Jesus says that, that their response to the weak and powerless, the way, the way we res- you respond to, to someone weak and powerless, is the way you respond to Jesus. The way you respond to them is the way you respond to him, and the way you respond to him is the most important decision you'll ever make. In the story, the way that you respond to the the weak and helpless, is the way you respond to Jesus, and responding to Jesus is the most important response 
most important decision or question that you'll ever, you'll ever face. Jesus tells it as a story. It's a bit like a parable, but a bit different. Parables are, are a teaching story that has a point. Uh, and this is a bit like that, but, but it's more like Jesus is saying, this is what hap- will happen when I return. And, and the stakes that he talks about couldn't be higher. Maybe you still have the, the last words of the Bible reading ringing in your ears. Um, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I don't think there are higher stakes than this. And so it's really important we listen to what Jesus says as Jesus teaches us uh, today. Now, we've been dealing with this idea of the return of Jesus for some weeks now. Uh, Jesus, if you remember, if you've been here, Jesus has been sitting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem, uh, and they've asked him about his return. They've asked him, you know, when will you return? When will the world end as we know it? And Jesus, in response, has told them story after story after story. Firstly, kind of dealing with the kind of the destruction of Jerusalem coming, but then beyond that to, um, to the time he'll return. It's not something that we're unfamiliar with, this idea. In our Apostles' Creed, it says that um, Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. We know that's what he's going to do. And so he's been piling up story after story about this. And I think the fact that we've been talking about it for some weeks now shows the significance of it, the importance of it, how important it is uh, that, that he wants us to, to think about these ideas. And so some, over the last few weeks, we've had different big ideas. We've had the idea of, of not knowing when Jesus will return and not really you know, being meant to find out, but just being, being ready. So there's a big theme of being, being ready. We've seen Jesus' concern for us, for our perseverance uh, in, in the last days, however long they might be. He wants us to be ready to meet Him, either at His return or at the end of our lives. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the story of the young ladies uh, who were waiting for, for the groom uh, to, to come on his procession to the wedding. And that taught us to be prepared to, um, to, to play the long game, to, to have hope, even when Jesus' return may seem just like it's never going to happen. Um, it taught us to be prepared, and not just to look prepared, but to, to hold on despite the long wait. Last week we had the story of the bags of gold, or the parable of the talents, and that taught us to see the, the amazing investment God has made in each and every one of us. Not just the blessings of life that we have, that our money and time and resources and all the good things, but, but the spiritual blessings that, that God entrusts to us. The treasure in jars of clay, the, 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 um, the knowledge of Jesus, Christ in us, the hope of glory, what riches we have. And, and the question we ask is, well, how, how are we using that? How are we investing that? Jesus expects a return on investment with us. He invites us to be part of His work uh, in growing and multiplying the kingdom of God uh, for our good, for for the the world's good, uh, for the glory of Jesus. And so, over the last few weeks, the question we've been asking again and again is, are we ready? Are we ready? Uh, Are we waiting in hope for whenever it might be, our life's end or the return of Jesus? Are we being faithful with what He has given us? Faithful while we wait. Are we living in hope, in faith? And what goes with hope and faith? Faith, hope and love. Today, we, the story, Jesus' story turns to living in love. Faith, hope and now love. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a simple story in some ways. I'm not going to read it again. I'll summarize a little bit of what happens if you're less familiar with it. But Jesus says that He'll return in glory, in authority, uh, to judge. He says He'll separate people like a shepherd separates sheep and goats. I don't really know why shepherds separates sheep and goats, but it's a shepherd thing. Uh, and it's an image they would have understood. But He's separating, not actual sheep and goats, but people. To some, will re- they will receive life, eternal life. And others will be uh, taken away from His presence and the life that comes with that. And so these that he calls the sheep on his right-hand side, he, they receive life. Why? Jesus says to them, he says, well, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. Um, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. You, you clothed me when I needed clothing. Um, you looked after me when I was sick. When I was in prison, you visited me. And those on, on the right, the, those called the sheep, say, well, hang on. Um, 
I remember doing that for you. I think I remember, you know, in all your shining gloriousness. But Jesus responds to them, and I'll read these words direct. They'll be on the screen. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for, the, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then the story repeats, but with those on the left that he calls the goats, the ones that Jesus rejects. Why? Well, because they didn't feed him, didn't clothe him, didn't welcome him in, didn't care for him, didn't visit him. And they had the same reaction. Come on. I think I remember if you needed something, Jesus, in all your shining majesty, if you, know, if you needed food, I would have given you food. I just didn't. And Jesus responds to them in the same kind of, well, in the opposite way. Verse 45, uh, he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least one of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We've got to ask, well, I mean, who's Jesus to make this kind of judgment on, on people? And if you remember all the way through Matthew over the last couple of years, as we've dipped in and out, there's been this big overarching theme of Jesus' authority. Like the whole story has been kind of establishing him. This is the one who was to come. This is the one with authority. This is God's uh, promised king, powerful over everything. He's the one with authority, and now we see the authority to judge. And he's claiming that authority for himself. Notice how he starts the story um, on the screen again. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And Jesus claims the title for himself, the Son of Man. And that's, uh, you might know this, it, it's a reference to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And, and Daniel there receives a vision and the vision shows one like a son of man. I mean, it just means a person who looks like a human, who is a human. But that, that language then makes you think of that story. And this one like a son of man approaches the throne of heaven and is given authority to, to, to rule and to judge, given power over everything. So Jesus says, I'm that guy. I'm that guy from that prophecy, from that vision, that story. I'm the one with authority to judge. And you see, all the angels come to him, and all the nations are gathered to him as he judges. And he separates them like a shepherd separates sheep and goats. And I wonder if there's meant to be kind of an element of similarity. It's not like he's separating, uh, I don't know, the chickens from the elephants. I mean, you know, like sheep and goats, to an untrained person like me, they look pretty similar. There's not a lot of difference that you kind of, you, you, could, you could tell. It depends on the breed, I'm sure. But, but to the experienced shepherd, he knows which is which and knows what is what. And there's a real clear difference. They might kind of look similar, but there's a real difference between them. And, and this shepherd in this story, this judge, there's a difference between the people that he is judging. And, and it, a quick read, if we read this kind of quickly and don't think too deeply about it, it can look like this. It can look like the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation is how you care for the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, the sick. It seems that those who cared were given life and those who ignored them were given death. Just process that for a moment. How does that sit with you, if that's, if that's kind of what the story is teaching us? What do you think about that? Um, some of you may be familiar with, um, with Keith Green. Anyone familiar with Keith Green? Uh, very well-known uh, Christian uh, songwriter. Uh, had a great um, testimony of loving and caring for, for the poor. And he has a story about this song. And the, story, the song does finish, you know, well, the difference between life and death, you'll be judged on what you do. And I love Keith Green, but I don't think he quite captures the whole uh, element of, of this story here. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment. But, but you might feel some awkwardness, as, as you might feel awkward with the ending of his song, you might feel some awkwardness being like, well, hang on, this isn't quite, this isn't quite matching with what I know of the Bible or what I know of, of what I've said here. Let's do a little bit of a skim through some other verses uh, on the screen again. Um, are we really saved by how we treat the poor? Ephesians 2, um, for it's by grace you've been saved, it's a free gift, not by works so that no one can boast. Um, Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of the righteous works we've done, but by his mercy. 
Maybe Paul's on a different track here. But no, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what's going on here? Is, it, is our eternal life dependent on how we treat the poor? Or are we saved, not because of our righteous works, but because of His grace and mercy? Is Jesus contradicting Himself in other parts of Scripture? Well, no, I, I, think, I think He's calling us to radical lives of love, but we need to keep reading and keep reading carefully and seeing how the story unfolds. You see, when those people that He commends as the sheep, um, they're told they're getting life because of how they've, they've acted, um, they don't say, well, of course, you know, that, that's why I did the work, so I would get into heaven. This makes total sense. They say, hang on, I, I, don't, remember, I don't remember doing this for you. But Jesus says, no, no, whenever you cared for the least of my brothers and sisters, whenever you showed love to them, you were showing love to me. The way you responded to the least and the lowest is the way you respond to me. And the, and the flip side is, is for the other, for, for the goats. So can you see what the divider really is here? It's not what we do that saves us, that's the focus, it's the response to Jesus. It's the response to Jesus that's the, the dividing line here. What you did for them, you did for me. How they respond to Jesus is the core of it. Um, we're partway through our Simply Christianity course uh, at the moment, and what I, I love about it is that it kind of gets to the just the the simple Christianity, the, the basic, the, the core of what we believe. And, and, and the kind of the starting premise with this course is that um, what is Christianity? It's not um, Anglican Christianity and all the kind of the forms of stuff that go with that, or Baptist, or Presbyterian, or Catholic, or it's not those kind of, it's, it's, it's not the things that come with Christianity. What's, what is it at its basic level? And the, the, the definition they use, it's not ceremony, ritual, philosophy, or practice, Christianity is your response to, to Christ. Christianity simply is a response to Jesus. Christianity. How do, you, how do you respond to Christ? And that's what Jesus is showing here at the fundamental level. The most important thing is how you respond to Him. Now, I don't want to then cancel out all the weight of what He's saying about, you know, loving and, and those kind of things. It, we're not saying, when you're saved by grace, don't worry about living lives of love. Absolutely not. J- we're not saying Jesus saves us, doesn't matter what we do. No, Jesus tells this story with weight, doesn't He? He, he tells it with, with gravitas, uh, with, with life and death consequences. And He's not saying, you know, you're saved by your good works to the poor, but He's saying your good works show what's underneath. Your good works are a direct outcome of your response to Jesus. Um, plenty of people do good things that couldn't care less about Jesus, and, that, and that's great, and that's, and that's wonderful. But what's important is how you respond to Jesus and how that flows out into lives of love. Your life and your work shows what's underneath. And in this context of the stories he's telling, your life and your work show how ready you are to meet Jesus. Responding correctly to Jesus as Lord, as Saviour, as one with all authority. This response has got to flow out into your lives, that you'll see it in how you treat the least and the lowest. So we'll, uh, the way that we've been loved will shape what we love, will shape how we love. Um, these works don't save you, but the stories are diagnosis, diagnosing your heart, asking us, are we on the sheep side or the goat side? What do our lives say about how we've responded to Jesus? And it's worth pointing out here, just to be kind of a bit more accurate, I mean, through the Bible, there's this kind of constant, uh, sort of recurring theme of God's people caring for, for those around them, caring for the world, uh, caring for the poor, for the foreigner, for the widow and the, the orphan. And time and time again, you know, God says, you'll be a blessing to all nations, and this is part of uh, God's people blessing all nations in, in caring for them. They become a blessing to the world. And that's true, and that continues, and we want to keep uh, keep thinking about those things, but Jesus does sharpen here who it is particularly that they're called to love. Um, notice Jesus' words again uh, on the screen. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
and verse 45, truly I'll tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to the crowd? No, he's talking to his disciples, um, his, his followers, his people. And he's pointing to these, these around him, the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, those sitting with him. Um, throughout Matthew, the, the references to his brothers and brothers and sisters are, are, are his followers. And sometimes his followers are, are called the least, the least or, the, or the little ones. It's almost childlike imagery uh, as Jesus talks about uh, his followers. So he's not talking about the, the world in general. As important as it is to love and care and be involved in charity, all those kinds of things, uh, he's sharpening our attention to the household of God. How do we treat the least, the smallest, the lowest um, of our brothers and sisters in Christ? And how we treat each other opens a window uh, into how we've responded to Jesus. Um, we, we, we find that Christianity is not a solo adventure. I mean, sure, we stand before Jesus ourselves, but we walk through life with each other. We're called particularly to show Jesus' love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus says elsewhere, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. I think we do, in all kinds of good ways. I'll come back to that in a little bit. But what, what do we do? What, what should we do now as we approach this story again? I think we've got to let the weight of it sit in our hearts a little bit. We can um, push it to the side and say, oh, I'm saved by grace, um, and Jesus forgives my ungenerosity, and, all those, and those things are true. But why does Jesus tell this story? Help us see our hearts. So imagine it was you standing before, you know, the undercover boss re revealed, the examiner, and the criteria is, well, how does your love uh, to your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, how's that going? What's your, what's your mark for that? How have you loved those who you might not click with so well? Uh, how do you love those who can give you nothing in return? How do we love those who are, are sick and struggling? How do we love those who are the children of our church, like I talked about before? What would our own report card be for those things? Again, we're not saved by what we do, we're saved by Jesus. But Jesus asks us this story, and tells us this story and calls us to examine our own hearts. Now, again, we're not left going, oh, I, I, I've I haven't done enough myself, I've failed. It, what, is, what happens directly after this story? What do you think Jesus does directly after telling this story about loving the least and the lowest? I'll read it. I'll read the next two uh, verses from next week's reading. Spo spoilers, sorry. But, uh, but this is what happens straight after he does, tells all these stories. Uh, verse 1 of the next chapter, Jesus had finished saying all these things. He said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. See how close we are to this bit of the story? He's telling His disciples, live in, in, in love and service of the helpless. This is the way they're ready for my return. Uh, live in, in selfless love. And then He turns around and practices what He preaches. Um, he pre prepares to, to lay His own life down. He calls his people to, to be the, the sheep, right? The sheep who, um, who, who care uh, for those who can't care for themselves. And he's the shepherd. But he's the shepherd who then turns around and becomes the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, the lamb who by his own death in our place and dealing with our sins can make us be these, these sheep of the story, Right? the one who can help us to be those who live this way. As He lays down His life for us, we're then able to lay down our lives for, for each other. We can pour out our lives in service for those who can give us nothing in return, just as Jesus pours out His lives for us, in all our selfishness and in all our failures to love. So Jesus gives us this, calls us to be ready, and then goes and makes us ready, turns and heads towards the cross. Again, it doesn't take away kind of the weight of what he's been saying, but it shows us the possibility that we can actually live this way. 
Um, this is the end of the, the stories. We've reached the end of the, the stories Jesus has been telling about the end, about his return, about judgment. And so these questions have been kind of being repeated to us, and I wonder if the question has been sinking in for you over the last few weeks. Am I ready? Would I be ready today? Do I maybe look ready on the outside, but maybe not on the inside? Um, am I being faithful with what God has given me? Am I, am I living uh, faithfully today with what God has given me? Or am I grasping it for myself? Um, am I living and working for the day when Jesus will return and, and can say to me, well done, good and faithful servant, come share your master's happiness? Am I living for that day or does my vision not quite go that far? Do I, do I not have the hope that, that, that helps me see that reality? Is my love shaped by Jesus' love for me? How can I live in response to this love? And maybe for some of us, we might realize over these weeks, well, maybe no, I'm, the thought of meeting Jesus terrifies me. Maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I've never really said, yes, Jesus, I trust in you, because I really trust in myself. Maybe you, you say, my life is my own. But maybe you don't want that to be the case anymore. Maybe you want to say, I have been the king of my life, but Jesus, I want you to be king. Now, when I stand before you in all your glory, I want you to say, this one, this one's with me. Uh, he shares in my death. She shares in my life. Welcome. Uh, perhaps you've never truly put your life into Jesus' hands, uh, His strong, His powerful, yet nail-pierced hands. Maybe you want to do that. Today would be a great day to do that. Um, Jesus has been speaking to us, holding out life and death, saying, choose life. Choose life with Him. If we get to the end of, of in a moment, I'll, I'll pray and I'll pray along these lines, if that's a prayer that you want to pray yourself, turn away from being my own king, I want, to be, I want you to be my king, then you can pray that in a few moments. I just want to think a bit about, about how we love, and how we uh, show love to our world around us, and to our brothers and sisters, and then I'll, then I'll pray at the end. Uh, this week, I've had a few opportunities to, to kind of think about our, our response of, of love to our world. Um, during the week, I met with some senior leadership from Anglicare, um, as we kind of prepare to um, have a, a greater partnership uh, going, going forward, as we kind of think about our, our church and, and the shop and different ways we want to love and serve people. And I'm so grateful for the way Anglicare help us have a practical loving care for our town and for our world. That's a great thing. Um, during the week, I also met with, had lunch with a guy from Compassion Australia. Compassion, uh, the guys that across the world um, provide programs for, for kids and communities. Uh, helping people, uh, releasing people from poverty in Jesus' name. Um, I love compassion. We sponsor a child through compassion. Others of you do as well. I'm looking forward to kind of sharing more about their work with you uh, in the coming months, uh, hopefully growing that partnership a bit. And I'm just, I'm just, you know, just so grateful for these opportunities, for these people, for Anglicare, for compassion, ways that we can, um, we can practically show love um, to, to the people who are needy and, and poor, people that we've no way we're going to get to, but they're across the world, and we can, we can be part of that. That's a beautiful and wonderful thing. I love you to be involved in that. And it's great these organizations can help us to love, but it's a challenge, and I was challenged as I kind of met with them, and I was thinking through this passage, I don't want to just outsource our love. I don't want to just show it across the globe, um, but I want it for myself. I want it for our church in practical uh, regular, physical, tangible ways. And as I was reflecting there, are just so many ways that our church already is a community of compassionate love and sacrificial service. Many of you are part of that in all kinds of ways, and it's a huge encouragement. Um, I see people providing meals for each other, driving people to appointments, visiting people in hospital. Um, I'm really encouraged to see groups springing up recently to pray for each other. They're praying for each other and for the needs of our church. Um, I'm seeing uh, there's a group that's trying to get kind of open church on Saturdays going again, providing a place for our community to come in, for people to be prayed for. Um, uh, it's just so many, so many ways, that, um, and more than I, than I know about, of ways that we are a loving community to each other. I also see the gaps. I see where people fall through the cracks. 
uh, and that's sad as well. But we want to keep turning our eyes outward. Um, keep turning our eyes outward, thinking, how can I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, how can I love those that I don't necessarily click with or wouldn't necessarily be friends with? Um, what an amazing testimony when people walk in these doors and go, you guys are all pretty different to each other. <laughs> Why are you friends? Why do you love each other? Well, that's Jesus' love that, that, that binds us together. And we can always uh, keep loving more and more. So be encouraged with how you love and keep looking for opportunities to do that. Be the person with the listening ear. Be the person ready to pray for someone. Be the person ready to, to be open to, to practically helping someone, uh, treating each other with great respect and dignity. May the love we have for each other flow from the love Jesus shows us. Uh, Matthew's story, we're heading to the cross. We're heading towards Easter. The story kind of slows down over these next two days of narrative. But I pray as we, as we see again kind of the, this um, focal point of, of the narrative, we will see the love that we're shown, see the heart of Jesus for his followers, for us, and for the world. And as we see that love, it will shape our love for each other and for our world. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that we'll be that, those kinds of people. And I will pray, um, and you can join in if you'd like, uh, Give us the opportunity to say, yeah, I don't want to be king of my life anymore. I want Jesus to be king. Uh, let's pray. Father, we know so many, uh, so many times that we all uh, just want to be in control and um, hold the steering wheel of our life and hold on to what we can, can grasp and work for and rely on ourselves. Father, we love to be the ones that that make our own way in the world and provide for what we need. Um, we love to think that we are the king of our, our lives and destinies. Uh, but Father, we, we see in so many ways that we're not, um, how little control we have over what, what happens to us and what happens in our world. And I father, pray, Father, in that, that we see um, our need for you. We see that every other foundation we build on is shaky and can fall away, uh, but, but Jesus is not like that. Father, we pray that as we see Jesus, we'll see a firm foundation, we'll see uh, hope in the face of death, um, joy even in the face of sorrow, purpose uh, and, and meaning uh, in the face of, of, a, of a confusing and strange world. So, Father, I pray even for the first time for some of us that uh, we'd no longer be the king of our own hearts and lives, that we'd uh, take the crown off our own head and put it at your feet and say, Jesus, we trust in you. I trust in you. Um, Jesus, in your death for us, or well, your death for us is a gift and we say thank you for that gift. That death is the death you died for me. Uh, and Father, uh, uh, Jesus, as you were raised to life, defeating death, and you hold that life to us, we say thank you. That life is our life too, because we stand with you and you with us. May we trust you, may we walk with you through all the ups and downs of life. Uh, please hold on to us as we hold on to you. And Father, we thank you that as we go through this life, you don't, you don't promise us an easy ride or no pain or struggles, but we thank you that you give us each other to walk through life with. And I pray that we would be a community really shaped by love, um, that we see so clearly how we've been loved by Jesus and that flows out to our love for each other. Um, we do know that we are a failing community of love, that there have been people among us who feel unloved or missed or overlooked, and we're sorry for that. Please help us to see how we can do that, how we can love each other better. Help us keep turning our eyes out to those uh, who need to be listened to and prayed with and cared for, Sometimes it's our turn to love and sometimes it's our turn uh, to be loved and looked after uh, and help us to be okay with that as well. Uh, and so we just ask that you keep growing us into a community of love that people would see us and go, what's going on with those guys? Uh, what do they have? Uh, and they might know this love and hope and peace and purpose and joy that only comes through knowing Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Dave's going to keep uh, leading us in some prayer.
Let's keep on talking to our Father. David wrote in one of his Psalms, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Lord, we trust your goodness and uprightness for you alone are our hope and salvation. Give us the humility that we may hear your instruction and we learn more and more to walk in your way, in your paths of steadfast love and faithfulness that we may do as you command us, that we may love because you love. Father, when we listen to you with our hearts, we are aware of our sinfulness, our need for salvation. When we respond to Christ as you command us, you are faithful and just, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know that you will make us yours forever. Help us always to respond to Christ in trust, faith, humility and obedience. Instruct us about loving you, that we may do as you command. And let us remember that you held nothing back, that we may live, that we may be alive in Christ. Father, thank you for the opportunity to have this chaplain and pastor to aid us to reach our community here, to show the love of Christ. We simply asked for a godly and upright person who is wise in your ways. And Father, for those of us who are ill, struggling with pain or other ailments, we ask for healing for patience and comfort. Show us how we may serve them in their need. And Father, build here a community of love and light that people may come to hear the gospel, be saved and know you forever. And we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. As we sing, we I guess I continue our response. We've responded to God's word as we've, as we've prayed. We continue our response uh, as we sing. We're going to be singing about uh, Jesus being the King of Kings, and maybe He's the King of your heart. And we're reflecting that as we uh, as we sing, how we've moved from darkness uh, to light. Uh, many of our people also respond to God's goodness in their in their own giving and generosity. Uh, during the song, uh, bags will come around, uh, which is what's my, number of people use in our church to contribute to God's work here and, and beyond. Um, that'll happen during this service. There's no obligation to give. Many people give online as well. So um, the bag can go past you. No worries. That's fine. Um, but if you do want to know more about our church or have you know, got questions you want to talk through with me or with someone else, you can use the Connect cards that are at the back. There's QR codes. You can find the website or you can, you know, walk up and talk to me. Uh, whatever you like, there's different ways of getting in contact and... Um, yeah, if you have questions or would like prayer, please don't go without um, having those questions answered or at least moving towards that as well. We're going to stand. We're going to sing of God's goodness to us. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the world from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
to reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died.
praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath, come now with praises before. Praise the Lord, praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore. pray as we finish up. Father, we've sung of our praise of you, and we ask that that won't just be uh, on our lips now as we sing, but uh, in our hearts and our lives as we go out from this place. We pray that you give us opportunities to love and care for uh, each other and to show your love to the world around us, that all nations will see and praise you for who you are. We commit ourselves uh, to you, to this cause. Uh, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stick around. We've got some morning tea. Some